Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of hearing your word today. And I pray, Lord, that the words I speak would be your words and not mine. And I pray, Lord, that they would get through to each of us individually and collectively as your church. Father, speak to us, we ask today, through the power of your Holy Spirit who lives in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, the sermon is likely to go over two videos, but they will follow one after the other in the playlist, and you shouldn't need to do anything with that. Today I want to share you the third message in our series on the letter to the Colossians from the Apostle Paul. And so as we continue through this letter, we know that it's a letter about discipleship as much as anything else. And discipleship comes with service. So what does the service of discipleship involve? Well, firstly, there is rejoicing in service. It says in verse 24 of today's scripture. Paul rejoices in his suffering for the church. And it's important to note here that Paul is equating suffering not just with suffering, physical suffering, but also with service. He lives a life of service to God, which as Christians we are all called to do. We are called to live a life of service. And in all service there is an element of suffering and cost. That suffering isn't necessarily bad, but it is definitely a cost. And while the cost we bear won't likely be as intense or as physical as Paul's, or especially that of Jesus, it is part of our service. So what could service actually cost us? Well, firstly, it will cost us our old life. Our old life. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. Now we can't serve God and keep hold of what we were before. The same principle applies whether it be money or something else. It's God or money. It's God or it's selfishness. It's God or whatever we want to do instead. It's God or sin. Jesus might have been talking about money, but as I said, the principle is the same. The cost of service in this case is our old way of life that we must leave behind. It will cost all that we are. Romans 12 verse 1, Paul said, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. If we are truly devoted to God with all of our heart, with all of our soul and with all of our mind, and if we love our neighbours, then we actually lay down our lives for them, submitting everything on God's altar. It will cost, it does cost our life. And Jesus gave us that example in Mark 10 verse 45. Jesus said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. In Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8, Paul said, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of, as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, our service 
will likely involve a form or some form of suffering, big or small. But it will cost us something. Maybe it's our time, our money, our total devotion to God. For it's God that we're serving when we serve others. And so there is rejoicing in service. We also see, though, that service spreads the gospel in verse 27. You see, God has chosen us, you and me, to make this gospel known. He's chosen you and me to make the gospel known to all the world. To all the world. Jesus tells us this in Matthew, 18, Matthew 28, sorry, verses 16 to 20. You will have heard this before, more than likely. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them he would go. So it's after the resurrection. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Pardon me. So Jesus, with the authority he had, gave it to us to go and make disciples. In Acts 1 verse 8, he said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Matthew Henry wrote, Paul was a great apostle, but he looks upon it as the highest of titles of honor to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was a suffering preacher, Henry writes. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. He suffered in the cause of Christ and for the good of the church. He suffered for preaching the gospel to them. And while he suffered in so good a cause, Matthew Henry writes, he could rejoice in his sufferings, rejoice that he was counted worthy to suffer, and esteem it an honor to him. You know, we just prayed earlier for all of those who are being martyred in Kabul, in Afghanistan, and for others in other parts of the world too. These people, as Christians, have rejoiced in their suffering. They suffered to preach the gospel, even unto death. They counted themselves worthy because they could suffer for Jesus. Do we? When we are ridiculed for being Christians, what do we do? Do we get angry or upset? Or do we ultimately rejoice because Christ is using us? People only get, only ridicule us because they know who we are and whose we are. Why? Why did Paul rejoice in his sufferings? Because he was called, like us, to present the gospel. God's word. You know, we have... Bibles that look like this or other books. I can't show you my phone because I'm using that to record, but I have the Bible on my phone. God wants all to hear his word. Paul says that in verses 25 and 26. He said, I've become its servant by the commission God gave me 
to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. And here's part of scripture that really made me want to go into formal ministry. But it's not just for formal ministry, it's for all of us. Romans 10, chapter, uh, verses 14 and 15. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring this to the world. But you know what? We may not necessarily need the physical version of God's word. It starts with us. It starts with the way we live. I preached a few weeks ago about living the worthy life, the first message in this series. That's how it starts. That's how people want to read this because they see this in us. We are to present the gospel to all the world. They're not going to hear it unless you tell it and live it. Matthew Henry says, Every man has a need to be warned and taught, and therefore let every man have his share. He says, First, when we warn people of what they do amiss, we must teach them to do better. Warning and teaching must go together. Makes sense. Secondly, he says, Men must be warned and taught in all wisdom. We must choose the fittest seasons and use the likeliest means and accommodate ourselves to the different circumstances and capacities of those we have to do with and teach them as they are able to bear. Paul says that he could be all things to all people, but never compromising his faith. We can too. You see, you might be better at witnessing to your neighbour because you know them. I don't. But I might be better witnessing to my next one now because I know him and you don't. God places people in our path and we need to step up and take the opportunity. Why do we need to share the gospel with people? <laughs> so they would know God and his glory, which was previously a mystery to them. In Psalm 62, David talks about seeing God's glory. In verse 2 of that psalm, he says, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. And then in verse 11 of Psalm 63, he says, But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glory in him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. One of my favourite worship songs is by a guy called Tim Hughes. He wrote my very favourite worship song called Here I Am to Worship. But he also wrote this song about God called Beautiful One. And I love what he writes in verse 2. Powerful, so powerful. Your glory fills the skies. Your mighty works displayed for all to see. The beauty of your majesty awakes my heart to sing. How marvellous, how wonderful you are. Beautiful one, I love you. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one. So true. We see this glory and we should want to share that. Powerful, glorious, wonderful, beautiful. God's glory fills the skies and awakes our hearts to sing. 